WDAY presents. We are responsible for 88 miles of river and then the rest of it is going to be all desert. And they don't know that crossing the river, it's actually already in the United States. So they take that risk and they jump in the river and a lot of times they don't make it. We want them to know that it's not just bad people that are coming in. We do have good people that are coming in for the job because they are fleeing from their country. If they don't work, they don't eat. You may have an apprehension. Here. ¿Cómo está? No tiene documentos. So es aquí legalmente entonces. Ilegalmente. Acaba de cruzar el río. On this side of the Rio Grande in Juarez, Mexico, thousands this past year have tried to enter the United States. Some have heartbreaking stories, but the U.S. Border Patrol tells us that the chaos at the border allowed criminal elements to bring drugs into the United States. Now it's many miles from the prairies of North Dakota to Juarez, Mexico, but a group from Fargo Moorhead came here to see the wall, meet those who protect it, and see those who want to get over it. Coming up, when a river becomes a wall. As the sun comes up over Mexico, a crisp, cool desert morning, the Texas town of El Paso awakens along the border. A wall that separates this town from Juarez, Mexico, has brought visitors from the north. Terry Brandt, bishop with the Eastern North Dakota ELCA, along with area Lutheran ministers, are here to learn more about the border, meeting with Border Patrol agents who walk them through what has been a tumultuous year. Control, X-ray 366. U.S. Border Patrol agent Sarah Cabrera took us along during her morning shift. If you're gonna see somebody walking from the other side of the river and you see them coming in, that's gonna be your obvious ones. Patrolling the canals, the wall, the dusty trail of dirt that separates Juarez, Mexico from El Paso. This is the river right there, and that's Mexico. It's just over, down the river, and right here. And they're in the U.S. And lately, the Border Patrol has been tried and tested. Hundreds, and in some cases, thousands trying to cross the border weekly. We had the largest group in Border Patrol history, 1,036 in one group, coming in, I want to say a mile from here. 1,036 is going to bottleneck. How many agents is it going to take to just take their names, to take them to the station, transport? And we're talking what time frame, like in a matter of what? And that was in a matter of, matter of seconds to minutes. The numbers are astounding. Our biggest day was 2,200 in one day. 2,200 in one day. And then you add 1,500 from the day before, and then 1,700 from the previous day. And how about these numbers? In 2018, the El Paso sector of Border Patrol apprehended 31,000 people for the year. This past May, here in El Paso, 38,000 for the month. As we ride with Border Patrol, an all too familiar sight in this case. From, they're from the country of Honduras. They're here illegally. These are their documents um, from Honduras. A young mother, Katie, and her seven month old son, Owen, from Honduras, walking through water and mud to give themselves up to the agent. ¿Por qué usted viene a los Estados Unidos? En en Juarez. So she's saying that she's coming because there's no employment in in her country. Um and they need to eat. She needs to provide for her child. Uh, she's a single mother with a child. So she's she's fearing for her. She needs you know to to provide for her child and that's why she's coming into to the United States looking for that. Katie had made her way to the border after paying a coyote to smuggle her and Owen north. But once here she found herself at the mercy of the smuggler 
in one of the world's most dangerous cities. That's what she mentioned. She started um, crying there. She said, they had me in this house for a long time and I was able to leave that house. Because a lot of these criminal elements, cartels, are gonna get them from their point of origin in their countries and arrange all that until they get with their families. So some of that time, they have to spend it in those houses, stored in their houses. Sometimes they don't even give them food. And it no doubt has been dangerous for Katie and her baby Owen. The weekend we were here in Juarez, Mexico, 22 murders. We are human beings. And how are we going to protect our country if we don't take into our custody anybody that we have? We have to take them in. And we have to go and investigate and run their criminal history to know who we're letting in and who we're not. Owen just sat and giggled, quite unaware of the desperation mother quietly wept at the hopelessness life had become. A lot of people are like, oh, Border Patrol is bad. No, they're waiting. You can see how they're waiting for us because they're safe. Now they're in safe hands. The group of ELCA pastors and others from Fargo Moorhead listened to the Border Patrol, mindful of their work in an area of the country where this battle is brewing. Those wanting to come to America at a time so many want them out. And I think today what we've heard is it confirms that um, most of the people that are coming uh, to the border are those that are seeking a better life or those that are running for their life. And um, it's rare that they see the drugs coming uh, to the border. So I think that's just a different perception than what we hear. If I could take away one thing from it um, is what they said at the very end of it. You know, we're human. You know, we're not going to be perfect. Um, I admire that, you know, that, that humbleness of saying I'm not going to get it all right. Uh, but they are looking for the best interest for all families, all people, uh, and, and just we allow them a little bit of grace. Coming up, the group from Fargo Moorhead gets hit head on with the reality of immigration and those escaping certain death. Down the dusty roads of Juarez, Mexico, and through the busy, cramped streets of this often dangerous border city, the group from Fargo Moorhead arrives at a shelter full of Central American mothers and their children, who are making a meal for the group that is here to hear the story. We aren't showing the faces of the women because they fear they'll be killed if returned home. Okay, she just said it was a really difficult journey from Honduras when she got to Juarez. Of the migrants' survival and hope. A lot of poverty, a lot of unemployment. Lolita from Nicaragua was part of a church group in her home country protesting government corruption. Because she supported the, the protests, the groups that were protesting, that was her crime. Her children received threats. What you want more than anything is to be able to live in your country freely, but she can't, so it's a very difficult decision for her to come here. Lolita now waits in Juarez to see if an asylum hearing will mean life in the U.S. or death back home. You're exposing yourself to a lot of um, a lot of danger. Yeah, not knowing where to sleep, uh, not having food. And this 19-year-old from Central America was photographed taking part in a march to protest government cuts to senior pensions. She received a threat for being in the marches. Um, some of her friends were killed as well. And so this teenager, here alone in Juarez, waits while family worries about her across the border in the U.S. So they separated the siblings. They let the sister pass, go through, and then they sent, um, they sent her back. Not back, but sent her here. And the process to get asylum for those trying to get into the United States can be confusing. The process can take months, even years, and the answer may still be no. The Fargo-Moorhead group was in tears listening to these stories and angry. I don't know anyone 
who seeing and hearing this would think it's okay to ignore this, to not, to pretend it and to, to say that this doesn't matter means that you are complicit in what's happening in the name of your government. And then I heard those stories, it wasn't even hearing them through the ears of a pastor or even as a bishop, but as a dad. As we heard today about children that were being uh, taken away from their parents. I have three children and I began to think as a dad, as the tears rolled from my, my eyes, thinking what would that be like to have others take my children away from me and uh, just can't even begin to imagine what that would be like. You know, and you, go, I, and you have to ask yourself, would I have the courage to leave? Would I have the courage to leave? But U.S. Senator Kevin Kramer of North Dakota has been to the border a number of times and says people in his state want the U.S. to remain tough on immigration. Kevin, I, I would have to say that if I was to look at all of the issues that played out in the campaign that made me a senator, the, the issue of border security, um, sanctuary cities, rule of law probably was the, the, the biggest issue and maybe the biggest reason I'm a senator because I think North Dakotans largely do agree with, you know, while we're very compassionate people, we are also people that believe in rule of law. And, and in law and order. And I think they're offended when they see people whose first instinct is to criticize the law enforcement officers rather than our own laws which create the problem in the first place. But those who witness firsthand the stories of the migrants today think otherwise. We've seen so much and heard so many awful stories and mistreatment of people that you can't prepare for it. As the sun sets, the border lights up. Migrants continue to arrive, agents apprehend, and a group from Fargo-Moorhead is wrestling with how to tell the story from the desert to the prairie back home. If we leave this place and we don't say anything, shame on us. And how do we share what we've experienced in a, in a way that uh, helps open other hearts and minds as well? Coming up, the group from Fargo-Moorhead visits the makeshift memorial of the mass shooting at the El Paso Walmart. Yeah. Oh, it's so moving. On a windswept afternoon in El Paso, Texas, the group from Fargo-Moorhead makes a solemn visit to the site of that August mass shooting here at the Walmart. The temporary memorial is full of names, pictures, posters, and letters from around the world. It's still raw. It's still raw. All those people. The young. Can't imagine the impact on the town. I mean, this community. Well, hope we're country. still we're still dealing with it. Uh, so many Mexican Americans and Latin Americans. They feel vulnerable now. They feel targeted. Today, the grandchildren of Maria and Raúl Flores, who were killed in the massacre gather to mark their grandpa's 85th birthday. They were loving people. They were always loving. They were always happy. They were always together. They come here often, as do hundreds. A pain that won't go away here in El Paso. A hate that shook the border town to its core. I think that feels good because it's, they're not forgotten. It's not like something ugly like this didn't make people just forget about them. No, people still care. On this side, Back on the border, Agent Sarah Cabrera points out to us Mexican National Guard troops now patrolling the wall as well. A new way to keep people from crossing the border. They're there as a deterrent. They can't apprehend. They can report, observe, report, but they, it has helped a lot. Actually, El Paso is the Border Patrol's original station, dating back to the 1920s. Today, there are 1,900 agents covering 270 miles of border. Agent Cabrera shows us the shoes and shirts that migrants have left behind as they attempt to cross, sometimes with fatal consequences. So some people try to get over into that canal and end up drowning in it. So having um, clothing and shoes, you're going to know that it's somebody probably that came in through illegally and just left a little bit of trace. Back home and on radio TV talk shows, we hear the argument why don't these people just use the right way, the legal way, to get here? Well, down here, migrants and immigration lawyers laugh at that. 
When people think of the right way, they typically think of, of what we call the family-based immigration system. Um, if I'm a United States citizen and I have a brother from Mexico who I would like to bring to the United States, and my brother is over the age of, of, of 21, my brother will wait 25 years. Even North Dakota Border Patrol agents came to assist here in El Paso during the most chaotic point of the border crisis, a time that smugglers used to get drugs across the border. The felons, my drugs, are going to go over here. Our checkpoints are wide open. So all those narcotics, all those felons are in the United States, and we don't know how many. We don't know what got through. While we were in El Paso, the director of the Border Patrol came here to say his agency had witnessed a 68% increase in the number of apprehensions on the southern border. Nearly a million people this past year trying to get into the United States. Yet, the director says, over 100,000 people were missed. And it's not just about drugs and overdoses. Criminal aliens and gang members make their way to and often past our borders every single day. These bad actors and drugs make their way into every town, city, and state in this nation. So many migrants not allowed into the U.S. to wait for asylum hearings are stuck in dangerous Juarez, Mexico. Churches and Catholic sisters often hiding, caring, and feeding them. Ooh, got it? Okay. Do we have more room in there? Fargo Moorhead group spent today cooking a meal and later served it to those just apprehended at the border and now sheltered in El Paso, many of them children. In Juarez, we found Xiomara of El Salvador. I have proof that they, that they sent me death threats. I have the proof. Her daughter, sick. They were forced to leave their country after death threats. They were pushing her to get into the gang and threatened to kill her daughter if she didn't uh, become a, a part of the gang. She has a lot of fear. She can't go back. We talked to some families at the shelter from Central America who told us at the border, U.S. officials separated their teenage daughters from them. The families were allowed to go into El Paso to a shelter, but the daughters were sent here to Juarez, Mexico, the dangerous streets where 25,000 others are waiting for asylum. Molly Malloy of New Mexico has spent her life working on immigrant issues on the border. We seem unable to really put ourselves in the, the shoes of the other person. And what would you do if your child was starving? Would you just sit there and allow your child to die, or would you move? Would you walk? But Arizona Sheriff Mark Daniels of Cochise County, a national expert on border security, says his county had finally had enough with all the chaos at his border. Cochise, my county, has taken a huge impact over the last three decades when it comes to what's going on in the southern border. What we've done is we took it in our own hands. Local government, our governor, we took it in our own hands to make a difference. The Catholic Bishop of El Paso, Mark Seitz, helped lead an effort to have churches in his city protect, house, and feed the thousands who have been arriving. Observers say the whole experience has transformed the bishop. You know, it's like if somebody were in a burning building uh, and they were running, you know, they're your neighbor, they're running f from the house, would you let them in or not? You know, uh, I, I think most of us would, uh, but that's what's happening on the level of nations right now. And we're, not, we're saying, no, go away, sorry. Coming up, the group from Fargo-Moorhead prepares to leave the border, but not before a moving mass where a small stream separate so much. Not long after dawn, in the heart of Juarez, Mexico, the Fargo-Moorhead group greets thousands of migrants in limbo, some waiting in tent cities for asylum hearings in the U.S., others hoping to just get a number that may lead to a hearing. Hey, bud. Here. Yeah. Hola. Necesito. Yes. 
ELCA Bishop Terry Brandt, along with ministers and lay leaders from the Eastern North Dakota Synod, distributed things the migrants all needed. Toothbrushes, toothpaste, shampoo, and hygiene products. Necesita? Yeah? Si? This young mother from central Mexico, Flor, has a nine and three-year-old. They are sleeping through freezing temperatures at night in these tents, hoping for a chance to get on the other side. What did they escape from? They couldn't even take their kids to school. It was that bad. <clears throat> they ha they're afraid. They are afraid. That's why they're asking for asylum. There's no doubt about that. Flo and her two children are here with about 300 others in a city park in Juarez, Mexico, one of the world's most dangerous cities. Again, U.S. Senator Kevin Kramer. Our asylum laws are very liberal, as are all of our immigration laws. And, and they're very generous. They're the most generous of any country in the world. Consequently, that creates a magnet and it creates an opportunity for mischief. So what you see is you see some legitimate asylum seekers and you see many that are not. So you're going to station one, to the tents. Meantime, the mother and baby from Honduras that Border Patrol agents apprehended Katie and Owen. Yeah, they were right here. They were like just right there. Got fitted with ID wristbands, put in a van, and sent to this detention center near El Paso. An immigration expert doesn't have high hopes for the two. So this, this mom we met today, there's a good chance she will sit for months and months and just get sent back. Yes. You see it all the time. Yes. I mean, can't you just put your heart in that mom wanting what's best for that kid? My nephew is nine months old right now. So I saw that baby and that's what I thought of, you know. And you can see him smiling. He doesn't know what's happening, you know. And you, at seeing that child, you want the best for them. The kids don't have a fault in none of this. And what do these Lutheran ministers, from Oaks to Enderlin to Fargo, hope to bring home to their congregations who may feel disconnected to all this? I, I mean, I think that's just a call to action for the, the church, and not just the Lutheran church or the Catholic church, but the church as a whole to step up and say, we can't let this happen. We can't let this tragedy continue. And so I think it's a call to action. You know, all we can do is speak from our experience. So what I've seen, what I've heard, what I felt, and I'm really holding that as I go home. It's on them how they receive the story, not on me, because I, I can do nothing less than share it. I can do nothing less. What you saw and what you heard. What I ha saw, heard, and felt. As the team from Fargo-Moorhead wrapped up its week of discovery along the border, a meaningful, rare mass, Lutherans and Catholics, Mexico and U.S. residents celebrating church on both sides of the border. It hurts, um, and now passing at the peace and we can't cross the water. Um, it's hard, it's hard. A shaggy street dog from Juarez joined bishops from the Southwest. If we have not cared for those who are, are fleeing situations that threaten the lives of them and their families, how can we expect God to open the door of his house for us? A small, slow running river that usually separates the two sides, finally bringing people together.